here. And uh, today, Dr. Kowalek, he will be talking to us about the human animal bond and ho homeliness. And Dr. Kowalek, he graduated from the University of Glasgow. And as a professional background, he worked for the SPCA of uh, Northern Nevada for Nevada Human Society. And currently he works at the Riverside Veterinary Hospital, as well as uh, as a relief veterinarian. So thank you very much, Dr. Kovalak, for accepting our invitation to talk to the students today. And feel free to start your presentation. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. I can't see you or hear you, but I assume you're all watching attentively. So that's great. Um, yeah, so we'll get started. I've got all my notes here, so I'll be reading you a big old long story. Um, purpose of our talk today, we're going to understand the depth and breadth of the human animal bond, the benefits and costs of having a pet as an individual experiencing homelessness. We're going to bring awareness to our unconscious biases and re-examine preconceived ideas about homeless folks who have pets. And learn about organizations globally, nationally, and locally that are serving their communities. So first thing, see how well this works. All right, we're gonna go to a linked video and hope this all runs seamlessly. So this is a video done by uh, Companions and Animals for Reform and Equity. And watch this together. Approximately 6.5 million companion animals enter U.S. animal shelters nationwide every year. And we want every one of them to find a loving home. But too often, the desire to protect pets in our care creates barriers to clearing the shelters. We should ask ourselves, are we looking for reasons not to adopt? Would this group of passionate animal welfare advocates get past the barriers found within common pet adoption applications? Please leave the group if you have young children. Please leave the group if you rent your home. Please leave the group if you are over 50 years. Please leave the group if you don't have a fenced-in yard. Please leave the group if you have other pets in your home. Please leave the group if you work more than 40 hours per week. Please leave the group if you travel for work. Potential adopters want to do the right thing. Let's help them. People without homes, seniors, renters, families with small children and other marginalized groups all have love to give. Together, we can remove barriers to adoption so they too can share their lives with companion animals. Inclusion equals life saving. So that's just to kind of set the stage for how we may inadvertently be setting barriers and kind of prejudging people who ought or oughtn't to have pets. So here are some pictures from a variety of sources, but basically all persons experiencing homelessness that have got dogs living rough with them. And I think the first time that I saw images like this, I definitely had a response of, why on earth would you bring an animal to that situation? Why would you own an animal knowing that you can't provide for them? So I have since learned and corrected quite a bit. Um, so yeah, just kind of maybe take a pause for a minute and think about, you know, your thoughts about these images and what it brings up for you. I really like the tagline of the video was inclusion 
equals life saving. And that's, I think, the case reciprocally and with regards to what the pets provide for us. So the human animal bond, the American Veterinary Medical Association defines as a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals that's influenced by behaviors essential to the health and well being of both. This includes, among other things, emotional, psychological, and physical interactions of people, animals, and the environment. The veterinarian's role in the human animal bond is to maximize the potentials of this relationship between people and animals. Um, this is a little picture display of my heart dog, Kaylee. Uh, Kaylee is deaf and was born with one eye. She's been with us since 2011, and uh, we acquired her in the UK. She was brought into a friend of ours clinic to be euthanized at 14 weeks old. Uh, she was in her fourth home because they just couldn't care for her. And she is, of our dogs, probably the best trained, um, irrespective of her disabilities. The US Department of Housing and Urban Development defines homeless as an individual who lacks a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. They do an annual survey on a random night in January. Um, I think this is last year's data. There are more than 550,000 people experiencing homelessness in the US. It's estimated that five to 10% have pets, and in some areas of the country, that rate is as high as a quarter of them. So that's a lot of pets living with homeless people. Some of the benefits of pet ownership, a love and companionship, a sense of purpose, unconditional acceptance and non-judgment. They provide a source of comfort, literal physical safety, warmth. They can facilitate interactions with other people and provide improvement mental well-being. Uh, some of the disadvantages, they can really limit sheltering options that are available. They can be a barrier to accessing care. There can be negative perception and judgment from people, and they're, of course, a financial requirement. So internationally, there's a couple organizations um, that I'm aware of, and I'm certain that there's others. Uh, Street Vet is in the United Kingdom, and Pets in the Park operates in Australia. So we'll go through some of what they do here. Uh, Street Vet is seeking out people, their dogs living rough, and delivering care and support required to ensure their combined well-being. Combined with the critical support of a host of renowned organizations backing their team of qualified professionals, Street Vet is changing the future of homeless dogs who may otherwise have to go without the care they need and deserve. Um, this is a little video of one of their founder, founders, Jade Stat, talking about, they've got uh, uh, an accredited hostel scheme. I'll let you watch this. Did the first video play okay? Yes, you need to for me. Street Vet is a charity that offers free accessible vet care to pets belonging to those experiencing homelessness across 16 locations in the UK. Street Vet has uh, over 500 volunteer vets and nurses who outreach every week on the street. My co-founder Sam Joseph and I decided that we wanted to look at some of the aspects and the costs that people experience through having pets on the street and one of those is access to accommodation. So we've created a scheme that's called the Street Vet Accredited Hostel Scheme. And what we're looking to do is encourage more hostels to accept pets, because at the moment, sadly, there's only 10% of hostels that are pet friendly and their family. And it's ultimately um, their reason for living. So I think that there are many of our clients who would absolutely say that their dogs have saved their lives. No question. So to me, it's really cool that these organizations are um, like not only just trying to kind of help the animals of people experiencing homelessness, but they're really trying to find ways to integrate that they have animals and they can get care, you know, veterinary care and other kinds of care like shelter as well. Uh, Pets in the Park is based in Sydney. They aim to support 
build relationships with and improve the well-being of homeless people in society living with animal companions. Uh, many people who are experiencing homelessness own pets that play a significant role in their lives. These much loved pets offer unconditional love, companionship, emotional support and security, basic human needs that are often not met elsewhere. Although pet ownership greatly enriches the lives of those who are homeless, it also comes at a significant financial cost. Annual vaccinations, flea treatment, routine deworming, desexing, and microchipping all costs a lot of money. Um, Pets in the Park is a registered charity that runs free monthly pet health clinics in Darlinghurst and Parramatta, and they do free quarterly desexing clinics. They're run completely by volunteer veterinarians and veterinary nurses. They strive to provide emotional and educational support to owners and practical help to their pets in a social and friendly environment. By reducing the financial burden of pet ownership and by promoting access to human social services by operating in partnership with well-established providers, they aim to make a difference to both animals and people in Sydney experiencing homelessness. So we've got a little video, a little news clip of their organization here. A group of Sydney vets are giving up their time to make sure animals living on our streets stay as healthy as possible. Homeless pet owners often can't afford expensive bills, but a wonderful new community service is giving their best friends the help they need. This is Roxy, and she's not feeling very well. We'll get you better, hey? Her owner loves her, but he simply can't afford expensive veterinary bills. Roxy is one of thousands of dogs owned by the homeless or people who battle to make ends meet. I get really upset when she's um, unwell. And when I, I get upset that I can't afford sometimes to take it to the vet. That's why Sydney vet Mark Westman and a group of other volunteers started Pets in the Park. It was just something I started thinking who's looking after these animals and when I realised that really there was no one out there taking care of them I felt like it was some small contribution I could make with my skills and my time. He had the idea while travelling India treating six street dogs. These are people that genuinely love their animals and these animals play a huge role in their lives but they just don't have access or the resources to have the veterinary care that they need. For dogs like Lucky it means he receives veterinary treatment free of charge. Isn't that right mate? Pets in the Park meets on the last Sunday of every month at St John's Anglican Church in Darlinghurst. To be eligible, owners need to be referred by community services. Many live on the streets. They love them very, very much. They're everything in a lot of cases, you know. A lot of people have hit rock bottom and that dog is always there. Roxy's treatment worked. She received medication from the vet and is on the road to being a healthy little dog. Mike Duffy, 7 News. So in addition to those uh, couple of international organizations, there's a whole host of groups in the U.S. Uh, doing this kind of work. There's a com community veterinary outreach, street dog coalition, and the University of Tennessee has a couple programs, homeless pet help, human animal support services, and feeding pets of the homeless. So we're going to go through some of these here. I'm uh, on the board of feeding pets of the homeless and have been for about two years now. So I've, they've kind of been the ones that have supplied me with most of this groundwork for this presentation today. Community veterinary outreach aims to pr improve the health of individuals and companion animals experiencing homelessness through a One Health model of care. So by offering human health services and health education alongside preventative veterinary care, Community Veterinary Outreach seeks to improve access to veterinary and human health resources for an at-risk population and leverage the human-animal bond to increase human health resource uptake. So this is a little infographic from them, basically of um, persons coming in homeless with animals, they offer a whole slew of other services and this is kind of uptakes of those services. So it's neat to see that just coming in for an annual exam for your dog or cat and some vaccines um, that they can also partake in smoking cessation or naloxone training or just get primary health care for themselves. The Street Dog Coalition uh, aims to provide free veterinary care and related services to pets of the homeless. And I've got a quote here from the founder, Dr. John Geller. I've continued to be impressed on how much harder homeless folks make their lives by owning a pet. 
These people have a very strong bond with their pets. They face added challenges of using public transportation, finding housing, working a job, even going to a doctor's appointment because they can't leave their pets at home. On the other hand, for many of our homeless, their pets provide a purpose to their lives where none would exist otherwise. So the University of Tennessee, um, these are a bunch of their programs. They have the Companion Animal Initiative of Tennessee, Vets for Pets of Homeless Owners, they have a whole program on the human animal bond, and they actually do training on veterinary social work, which is like a new, um, over the last couple of years, developing area of social work that is kind of targeted for um, people that work in the veterinary industry, but also uh, pet owners in the human animal bond. And I've got a quote here from Ruth Sapp, who's with their human animal bond group. Folks who are homeless are frequently disconnected from family and other stabilizing resources and friendships. And a loving relationship between a person experiencing homelessness and their pet may be the only stable relationship in their lives. There's a lot of risk living in a street or in a car. The companionship of animals helps anyone manage stress, so then even more so in this situation. It gives persons experiencing homelessness the opportunity to be in an unconditional loving relationship. So the benefits of human animal bond for folks who have stable housing are magnified for folks who do not. Many folks who experience homelessness suffer mental illness, chronic depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, PTSD, and that population is general at risk for suicide and high risk behavior. I believe that research has shown that folks make the decision to continue living because they wouldn't leave their pet with no caregiver. Sense of purpose is how it's described. Homeless Pet Help uh, is based in New York City. They give uh, dog food, blankets, dog coats, and sleeping bags to homeless dog owners in New York. Human Animal Support Services, they are an international coalition of animal services leaders and more than 30 pilot organizations transforming the traditional sheltering systems to serve the entire community in supporting the human animal bond. Um, so kind of what they're trying to do is rather than just get pets of homeless owners away from those owners and off the streets, they're acknowledging that um, a kind of a broader net of services can help if the animal just needs a surgery, that surgery can be done, that pet can be returned to their owner who is homeless and doesn't have to go into a sheltering system, doesn't have to be rehomed with anyone. So they're kind of making a lot of headway with, with that. Feeding Pets of the Homeless, uh, their mission statement is that they believe in the healing power of companion pets and of the human animal bond, which is very important in the lives of many homeless. Our task nationwide is to feed and provide basic emergency veterinary care to their pets and thus relieve the anguish and anxiety of the homeless who cannot provide for their pets. So we kind of have like a five pronged approach, it's like a big fork. Uh, promote to veterinarians and pet related businesses the importance of joining the program as a food donation site. Speak out on the issue of pet homelessness and the disadvantaged. Uh, campaign to food distributing organizations the importance of distributing pet food to less fortunate. Providing grants to licensed veterinarians and other nonprofit organizations that meet our objective to administer veterinary care to pets of the homeless and provide pet sleeping crates to homeless shelters. So we'll go through a bit of their stuff here for here. Um, so the most recent data I have is kind of up through June of this year. Emergency vet care, uh, the organization took in nearly 5,000 phone calls. Uh, they've got a team of people basically who just answer and ascertain what it is that needs done, where they are, if they're truly experiencing homelessness and qualify. Of those calls, nearly uh, more than three quarters of them turned into emergency cases. Uh, the first half of this year, 471 animals were helped at a cost to the organization of uh, $160,000. The average cost for an emergency case is currently 340. And that's paid uh, directly to the veterinarian providing those services. Um, the average time of homelessness from feeding pets to the homeless data is about two and a half years. Many people are elderly and living on social security. The statistics th uh, that we have regarding this are from 2018. 
61% uh, of cases are called in by women experiencing homelessness. Over 29% are disabled persons. 6% are veterans. More than 20% are on Social Security. A third receive SNAP benefits. 28% were living in a vehicle, 14% were living on the streets, and 4% were living in a motel. Uh, of the animals that we treated, 89% are dogs and 11% are cats. We've also, I think, done some work with a pig, a ferret, some reptiles, and a bird. And about 5% of cases uh, end up e needing to be euthanized. The most common diagnoses for which people seek this care are ear infections, dental extractions, foxtail removals, laceration repairs, mass removals, parvo treatment, skin infections, and wound care. Um, we'll kind of bear those in mind because we'll talk about those later with regards to accessing care. Uh, so this is a case that Feeding Pets of the Homeless was involved with in the summer of 2019. We received a call from police officer Griggs in Detroit, Michigan. The officer was concerned about a dog who belonged to a man living homeless on the streets. The dog had multiple wounds including a torn ear. We told the officer that we would need to speak with the man and interview him. The officer had worked a long night, then been to a seminar and would work again that night. However, out of concern and compassion for the dog, Officer Griggs would go find the homeless man and call us back. The officer found the man about an hour later and called us. We interviewed the man, his name was Doug. At the time, he'd been living on the streets for the past three years and stayed on the porch of an abandoned house. Doug had no phone, he also told our case manager he could not read or write. His dog Chino, that's Chino there, is an eight-year-old intact male pit bull Australian shepherd mix who'd wandered off while he was sleeping and been involved in a dog fight. Uh, we began calling around to veterinarians in the Detroit area and received a welcome response from Dr. Francis at Francis Animal Hospital. We got in touch with the officer who took Chino and Doug to the vet. After the initial exam, Dr. Francis called and said he was going to need to do surgery and amputate Chino's ear because it was very badly damaged. Chino had wounds all around his neck, some underneath that would require a drain, as well as he seemed to be losing weight. Feeding Pets the Homeless approved a discounted surgery estimate of $950. We paid a deposit of half the amount because we did not work at the hospital before. The surgeries were performed, uh, including injections and IV catheter and fluids. The dog was hospitalized, the full anesthetic, surgery, blood work, a drain, his medications, and a fecal test and heartworm test. We received the photos from the police officer afterwards. We called a follow-up on Chino a few days later. Dr. Francis was able to save the ear. He said he spent extra time at no charge and surgically fixed up the ear. He counted between 30 and 40 holes in Chino's neck, ear, and head. He cleaned up all the wounds. He said that Chino has hookworm and we assisted with, we assisted with the dewormer. Dr. Francis also recommended that we approve updating uh, all of his vaccines. That was done as well. Uh, he was ready to be discharged. The case manager called Officer Griggs, who went and found Doug and took him to go pick up Chino. The officer and Dr. Francis spoke to the man about making sure he ties Chino up when he's going to sleep to make sure this will never happen again. Uh, in total, Feeding Pets the Homeless assisted with $1,000 for Chino's procedures. The officer thanked Pets the Homeless for what we do and for helping Chino and Doug. He said Chino was so excited to see Doug that he could barely get the following photos. Uh, we thank the officer for his service and for being so kind to help. So the, the board of Pets of the Homeless, we actually have three veterinarians and this case brought up a conversation of um, one of the things that probably instigated all this happening is that Chino is an intact male dog. So now something similar happens, we also require that those balls go bye-bye just to kind of limit the risk of it happening again. All right. This is a, another case from this past spring. Erin uh, lost her job due to the COVID-19 crisis at the end of February. She then lost her home mid-March, so she moved into her RV in the desert in Dayton, Nevada. She stopped by a campsite to use the showers and get water for her RV. She called Feeding Pets of the Homeless when her 11-year-old Jack Russell Terrier, Allie, developed mammary gland tumors. Allie was not spayed, and it's been proven that spaying your female dog significantly reduces the risk of mammary gland tumors. Uh, we contacted Dayton Riverside Veterinary Hospital, where I currently work, and approved an exam for Allie. The veterinarian completed the removal of a chain of mammary tumors and spayed Allie. The procedures involved anesthesia, injections, a catheter, intravenous fluids, 
x-rays, medications, and an e-collar. We provided almost $600 in services and got a discount on that. So this post-surgically, we took out a whole mammary chain. We spayed her and we took out a few more mammary masses and I don't think she had any metastases in her lungs at the time. Uh, Feeding Pets of the Homeless also sponsors veterinarians to have wellness clinics in their communities to ensure that pets are vaccinated and will not spread rabies, parvo, and other vaccinable diseases. In Carson City, each spring, pre-pandemic, uh, we've held a pet wellness clinic at uh, Friends and Service Helping. It's like a local outreach organization. Uh, Dr. Pulver in the gray shirt here from Timberline Animal Hospital, Dr. Ailes from Sierra Vet Hospital, and myself, uh, we donate our time, staff, and vaccines. Since 2014, when they started doing them, I think they've vaccinated over 330-some animals, mostly dogs and cats, I think is pretty much all we get. Since 2008, wellness clinics have provided care for more than 16,000 pets in 46 locations across the country. Um, pets of the Homeless has kicked in over $100,000 for that. Uh, remarkably, it comes out to like $6.11 per pet, which is pretty economical. The spring of 2018, Carson Animal Services Initiative partnered with Pets of the Homeless so that we could pay the balance due on any spay neuter vouchers that were given by their nonprofit. Uh, additionally, Carson City Animal Services, Nevada Humane Society was there to issue rabies tags for the dogs. Pet food supplies were given. Um, and all services were free to the first 100 pets that showed up. All right. The bond between the pet and its homeless owner is deep and soulful. Homeless individuals tell us that their pets offer them unconditional companionship. Their pets, just like your pet, offers them comfort, loyalty, and love in the form of licks and wagging tails. Research has reported that an animal's response is independent of its owner's age or economic circumstance. Owners say their pets cover their backs when they sleep in abandoned buildings, ditches, and in the woods. To break the homeless cycle requires the owner to move into a shelter. Most shelters do not allow pets unless they are a service animal. Homeless pet owners will not abandon their pet and do not have the funds to board the pet. So we offer crates to shelters that will allow a pet to stay with the owner. Basically, the shelter orders the crates online and gets them shipped directly at no cost to the pet owner or shelter, and the crate then becomes the property of the shelter for future use. So Pets of the Homeless has shipped, I think, 80 crates to shelters in eight states. So some resources available locally. The Nevada Humane Society, uh, I worked with them for three and a half years. They've got a big center in Reno and a smaller one in Carson. Uh, they do a lot of low cost services. So they do public spay neuter, public vaccines. Um, you can always surrender an animal if for whatever reason you it's a returned adoption or you can't care for it. And in certain circumstances, they'll do an RTO, a return to owner. So basically if the circumstance is such that a family just can't afford the care for this thing that is a relatively on the clinic side, an easy fix to just mend it and send it back, it's much easier than having to intake the animal and find it a new home. Uh, Cassie is Carson Animal Services Initiative. They're a group that started uh, in Carson City when the town needed a new animal shelter built and they kind of formed and raised the capital funds for that. They do a program called Critter Fixer Vouchers. And they're available to low income pet owners in Carson, Lyon and Story counties. And Options Veterinary Care, uh, they're coming soon. I, I believe they're projected to open at the end of October. They're gonna be on Longley Lane, just down the road from NHS Reno uh, and their whole purpose is kind of to provide access to care. And access to care is this idea that um, there's basically like care deserts where either clinics aren't available or the cost that those clinics are don't match what owners can, can meet. So they're gonna basically serve underprivileged uh, people. And uh, Pets of the Homeless, our data, most people are phoning about ear infections, dental extractions, foxtails, lacerations, mass removals, parvo treatment, skin infections, and wound care. So that's kind of going to be the main things that they're going to do services wise. So this year has been a roller coaster. I think we all can relate to that. Um, globally, the impact is just very diverse and widespread. 
specifically those in precarious housing and employment situations are in an increased risk of homelessness. Um, veterinary clinics are experiencing an increased demand for services. I don't know if many of you are uh, out in practice at all, you know, getting to, to see things. Um, it's been crazy busy these past few months. And because there's so many precautions to put in place to limit the spread of COVID, um, it's really sort of hampered the amount of animals that we can see. You know, we've gone to like curbside stuff and doing telemedicine and it's just not as time efficient to get through things. Um, the eviction risk in Nevada. This is some data from um, earlier this summer. The National Low Income Housing Coalition estimates 37 to 47% of Nevada households are at risk uh, of being evicted. So that comes out to like half a million people. And the estimate on that is that there's between 194,000 and 233,000 pets that are facing evictions across the state. So these, these are families that have had housing and have had pets that might end up experiencing homelessness and will have pets with them. So the take home message is the human animal bond is this wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, having a pet comes with benefits and drawbacks. Uh, the benefits are the love and companionship, sense of purpose, unconditional acceptance and non-judgment, they can be a source of comfort, physical safety, warmth, they can facilitate interactions and provide and prevent a well-being. And the drawbacks, especially if you're experiencing homelessness, are that they can limit your sheltering options, be a barrier to access and care, uh, cause some negative perception and judgment, and their financial requirement. So being homeless and having a pet is a, a really big thing to try and navigate. And there's a lot of organizations doing good work, uh, globally, nationally, and locally. And kind of through it all, there's, it's really important for the kind of the One Health perspective and interagency cooperation where they can access those other resources. So I'd like to thank Pets of the Homeless. They've uh, supplied with a lot of this. This mutt there is Bo. Bo is a street dog from Mexico who uh, ended up in our home when we were in vet school. So he really helped me get through vet school and navigate the challenges of going out into the world of being a vet. It was scary. So thanks to Genevieve Frederick with Feeding Pets of the Homeless, Jade Stat at Street Vet, Becky DeBolt with uh, University of Tennessee College of Veterinary Medicine, Alexis Nicely with University of Tennessee's Companion Animal Initiative, Ruth Sapp with their Human Animal Bond, John Geller with the Street Dog Coalition, Michelle Lem with Community Veterinary Outreach, Greg Hall, who's the CEO of Nevada Humane Society, uh, Denise Stevens, who's opening up that options veterinary care, Lisa Schutte, who's with the Carson Animal Services Initiative, Diaz Dixon, who's the old CEO at NHS, he's now with the Human Animal Sports Services, and Dr. Danny Larson with uh, Dayton Riverside Vet Hospital. And this is, I thought, a really good quote to end this all on. Everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. So ask me two questions or three questions, whatever you got. Are there, are there any questions? So these students want to know how can they volunteer or get involved in these programs, like here in Reno? Yeah, so that was a much easier question to answer uh, in 2019 before things went like totally pear-shaped. Um, reach out. I know the Nevada Humane Society, we definitely went through a pause where we kind of had to stop public services just because it wasn't feasible safety-wise to do it. They are doing it again. Um, and they are, again, having volunteers. So Nevada Humane Society in Carson and in Reno and SPCA in Northern Nevada, definitely all could always use volunteers. Um, we've kept up with uh, being a foster family for kittens because the spring, summertime, they just kind of like rain from the heavens. And there are so many of them that they can't fit them all in the building. So we just house them until they're of age to be spayed and neutered and send them back. So that's been fun. And they don't really care if you're, well, I think if you're living in a college dorm room, they might, they don't have to know where you live. You got somewhere to keep them, you're probably fine. <laughs> Thank you. And also they want to know how these organizations get funding, if it's mostly by donations, it's sponsorship. 
how does it work? Yeah, so I could speak to um, Feeding Pets of the Homeless. Uh, they've got an endowment, which is basically, I don't quite understand the financials, of it, but it's money that's been set aside to basically earn interest and we, we use the interest to keep things going. The main bulk of what keeps those projects funded is um, the team does a lot of grant writing mm -hmm. to organizations like uh, Maddie's Fund and they've, I think this year they've submitted something like 100 or so grant proposals as of our last board meeting in June. So they're very active in seeking funding and some of those grants are things that they, they can reapply for year after year. Some are a one-off, some are you know $500 and some are several thousand. Uh, in addition, it is a lot of donations, kind of word of mouth and people deciding where they want their money to go and be contributed to. Okay, that's great. Uh, do you guys have any other questions? Any thoughts that you would like to share? No? Cool. Well, thank you all for your time. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I really like some, some of the topics that you cover because I, I just adopt a dog this year. It's my second dog. I adopt one last year. And so just for these students can have an idea like this year for me to spay neuter, for me to vaccinate, and food and microchip and everything, it's, it will cost me like something closer to $600, $700. Wow. So I always say that dogs or animals in general, they are like a child, you know, you don't just adopt think, thinking that it's easy. You know, it's something that it's for half of your life, not half of your life, but at least 15, 20 years. Nowadays, since we are providing so much care for these animals, they are living more and more. And um, so it, 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 it is very expensive and we can totally understand why these people cannot afford. And um, I also noticed that, oh my God, all the clinics and all the services are completely booked. Because for me to try to vaccinate Charlie, my new dog, was very, very hard. Like most of the places that I was calling, even Nevada Human Society or SPCA, like they only have appointments for like one, two months. And, and we understand that why most of your cases are emergencies, because sometimes they try to wait, wait, and, and then there is a time that you cannot wait anymore and mm -hmm. and all the clinics and all the places are pretty booked so uh thank you very much for your service helping these people and all these animals and um there is also another student here sharing that it took me a couple months to get my cats in for their general checkup yes it's 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 been very crazy and we understand why there is so many restrictions nowadays uh, due to the COVID situation that we are living right now. But thank you very much for helping these people and especially the animals. And um, if you would like to say something else, please feel free to, to say or if not, then again, thank you very much for sharing your experience with the students today. Got it. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.